everyone. Welcome, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm Hallie Harrisburg. I'm the director of Michael Rosenfeld Gallery. And I am very delighted on behalf of the whole gallery staff to, to welcome you this afternoon for um, what I am sure is going to be a very informative and lively conversation about uh, Theodore Rozak. I apologize that we're at capacity for seating. Um, you have exceeded our expectations, um, and I hope you're comfortable. And I, again, I'm sorry um, that we don't have a comfortable seat for all of you. Um, Michael Rosenfeld Gallery proudly represents the estate of, of Theodore Rozak with um, Jeffrey Hoffeld Fine Art, and it has been an extraordinary partnership for, for many, many years. Um, the idea and desire to do an exhibition, a survey of his drawings has um, long um, been on our wish list. Um, it's taken an extraordinary amount of effort um, on behalf of Sarah and the um, estate uh, to organize um, all of their extraordinary holdings in order for my team to be able to come in and start to um, make a dream really into a reality. Um, I have spent hours and hours with, with Sarah and her uh, amazing estate assistant, Amanda, um, <laughs> looking at drawings from every decade, um, pulling and sorting and thinking and leaving for a couple of weeks and then coming back. And what I hope that we are presenting to you um, is um, a, a survey of an extraordinary mind a mind that was hungry for knowledge, for information, um, and who was incredibly prolific on paper and had so much to say. Um, I'm amazed at the range of his interests, um, everything from Norman Bel Geddes to um, purism, uh, to um, architecture, to Indian art. Um, it goes on and on and on, and there was such depth um, and sincerity in those interests. Um, we are not the first to do a survey of his drawings in the early 90s. The Drawing um, Center, um, led by Paul Cummings, did an extraordinary exhibition and catalog. Um, but we are certainly um, the, the next exhibition to follow that accomplishment. And I hope that our exhibition and our selections help all of you to better understand um, the, the life work on paper. Um, we are very, very um, honored to have Sarah Rozak, as you, many of you may know, is the daughter of Theodore Rozak with us today. Um, I can only say that if every um, artist <laughs> had an heir that championed their work like you, the art world would be a far better organized and um, lovely place to work in. Um, and with Sarah in conversation is um, Robert Slifkin, who is a professor um, at the Fine Arts, at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. And we had the pleasure of first meeting um, Robert working on uh, an exhibition and an essay um, looking at World War II and post-trauma images for which his interest um, was in Theodore Rozak at the time. Um, we thought of no better author, writer, thinker um, to delve into this extraordinary body of work when, when doing this exhibition. Um, a catalog for this exhibition um, will be available um, and Robert has written um, fresh scholarship uh, for us. Um, his work includes, and excuse the notes, but writing just so as you're thinking of your questions, he can draw from many, many different angles. Um, but his writings extend from Philip Guston and Donald Judd and Fitz Lane and Bruce Nauman and James Whistler, um, and also the concept of action painting. So um, he has a lot to share um, to the work of Theodore Rozak. So what today's format is going to be is a conversation between Sarah and Robert, and then we will allow at least 15 or 20 minutes for any questions that you may have, and then we will quickly scoop up your chairs and offer you a refreshment from six to eight. So enjoy, and thank you both for being with us. Thank you, Holly. So. <laughs> So you're going to begin with a brief biographical sketch yes. of your father. Yes. I, I thought I'd start by giving a biographical overview, very brief, but it is important because it uh, speaks to the work. Mm 
So he was born in Poznań, Poland in 1907, and he came to New York in 1910. Um, he started drawing at the kitchen table at a very early age, as long back as he can remember. Um, the home life was violent and unpredictable. Polish immigrants in Chicago, uh, very difficult adjustments with language, work, poverty, uh, all embroiled in confusion and with no real clear idea of how to move forward. Um, by 1917, at the age of 10, he started working, delivering papers, uh, golf caddy, things like that. But by 1919, at the age of 12, in the sixth grade, he already had his eye on the Art Institute of Chicago. He had cousins and other relatives who had gone to art school, and he saw that as a way for him to move forward with something interesting in life. Um, so he attended ninth school at the Art Institute of Chicago when he was 14 years old. In order to do that, he had to have a job full-time during the day to pay for the tuition. So this was wonderful. He went to art school. Unfortunately, he also, as a Polish Catholic, went to church on Sunday. And on Sunday, the, at confessional, the priest said to him, what are you doing? And he said he was drawing. And what are you drawing, naked women? You can't draw naked women. Son, you can't draw, you can't go to the art school. So a big conflict, and he decided to not to go to church anymore. <laughs> now, that, that solved that problem, but that created other problems at home. Um, he, he wasn't going, he, so he, he was working and going to the Art Institute, and he was just a kid. And the dean at the school said, you've got to go back to school. Get an education, then come. So he said, you know, an artist must know a lot of things. He must understand many, many aspects of life. He must be an educated person. It isn't enough to simply know, to know how to draw and paint. This was a new idea for him. He hadn't gotten that far. But he did that, graduated. And by 16, he was a full-time student at the Art Institute of Chicago. By the age of 18, he was teaching at the Art Institute. And he already had his eye on New York. He had, had saw that Chicago was provincial, and he wanted to go to where the action was. He had a fellowship to go to Europe for 18 months, and there he got really in contact with the modern movement for the first time. Most of that time was spent in Prague, which was, in fact, a very modern experimental city. And he came back, and he met um, uh, Moholy Naj there. He came to America at the age of 23, the beginning of the Depression. At 24, he met my mother. They got married six months later and settled in, in um, San Francisco, uh, uh, Staten Island, <laughs> San Francisco. He worked at the design laboratory. And uh, then he started to exhibit in New York. And in 1940, he had two simultaneous shows at the Julian Levy Gallery and the uh, Artist Gallery of Constructions. Um, 41, he started to teach at Sarah Lawrence College. 42, he moved to St. Luke's Place. And people who know me know that this is the house I still live in. In um, 1947, I was born. In 1951, he became attached to the uh, Pierre Matisse Gallery and exhibited very, in very small aspects. He had four shows with Pierre Matisse, a retrospective traveling show, a Zabriskie show in 78, and he died in 1981. So that's his biography. And now, uh, for the format of our conversation, we thought it would be interesting to hear his voice, because Rozak was an incredibly um, wide-ranging intellect. And there are uh, a few extensive interviews with the artist that you can actually read in total um, online uh, through the Smithsonian's uh, Archives of American Art. But Sarah has done the hard labor of um, going through those and excising some of the most interesting um, aspects of the interviews. And so I think we're going to maybe read three or four, maybe two or three passages and discuss them as, as a way to kind of get into the images and Rozak's kind of aesthetic theory. So the interviewer asked my father what his earliest memories were. And this is what his answer was. 
The first concrete association that I remember, I was probably three and a half years old, but it was very clear. It was an image of small children on a sidewalk by themselves. I discovered a railroad track. It must have been connected probably with the way my father went to work. He would go in a certain direction, and instinctively I would remember that direction. And standing on the railroad track, I remember seeing very, very clearly a kind of vanishing point as the tracks converged. And that vanishing point became larger and larger as I just looked and wondered at what was happening there. This vanishing point became larger and larger and then it loomed up into a figure of my father. He would stand there, pick me up, and carry me home. And I always remember wanting to go again to meet him. Then I discovered that it was the vanishing point phenomenon that interested me, and my father became secondary. This was an intriguing thing so that I, when I thought about it again, I didn't know quite whether it was first my father I wanted to meet or to experience this strange thing of those tracks coming at me again to a vanishing point. But even to this very day, I'm fascinated by converging lines that go to a common point somewhere because compositionally, it does a very powerful thing. It creates a vector of force and may well be this early association that points it up and dramatizes it particularly when associated with the anticipation of one's father coming from that point. So yeah, that's, I, find, I found that to be an incredibly um, uh, resonating statement in terms of, I, I guess, what, we, what could be called one of the central conceits of this exhibition, the title being Propulsive Transfiguration, this idea that Rosak's drawings have something to do both with energy, drawing as a form of energy, and drawing as depicting energy, and drawing as a means of transformation. But the idea of these um, perspectival lines meeting in a vanishing point, and for those of you who know either just the, the basics of uh, perspectival drawing and the history of Renaissance art, it's, it's the foundation to a kind of illusionistic depiction of real space onto two dimensions. But what's so interesting in so many of Rosak's drawings, there, there, there are, I'm, I'm looking at this one to my right uh, against the wall, the larger drawing on the bottom where you have this very characteristic kind of centrifugal composition where the forms seem to be pushing out to the edges and it's like an explosion and that you probably saw on the way into the gallery these two rather large drawings of stars that was a, a major motif throughout, I think, a major portion of Rosak's drawing career. But what, what's so interesting is here you see those perspectival lines or, or the, the lines that would be vanishing but they're not being marshaled to depict illusionistic depth. Rather, it's much more the sort of energy projecting outward. So that is the first thing. And then, so I mean, maybe one thing to say about that is Rozak seems to be uh, interested in somehow transforming the conventional um, techniques of depicting depth and illusion and turning them into something that's uh, producing energy. Uh, so they're not some, these are not images that are representing something. I think in general, one, one might say that Rozak is not um, a referential drawer. He's an imaginary drawer. And I think this speaks to the influence of surrealism. These are, these are works that are imagining something that has yet to exist, that maybe might exist in the future. There's a certain kind of visionary aspect, whether that visionary aspect is optimistic or pessimistic. Um, is an interesting question that we can continue to discuss. He also, uh, it, 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 I, I took this quote because of his um, interest in surrealism isn't exactly right because it's not um, surrealism in terms of art historical surrealism, but more in terms of a dreamlike quality that he experienced in life. Mm -hmm. That life was constantly itself flowing back and forth with these childhood memories and these strange associations and with his imagination which then pushed these things in all sorts of different ways so that he would start with the idea of a star but then he would find out everything about what is a star he would go to the museum of natural history he would go to the a planetarium he'd find out about molten metal 
He would draw meteorites. He would think about it. He would think about galaxies exploding, and then what would life be on another galaxy? Not in terms of science fiction, but in terms of a kind of more naturalistic speculation of how the energy of the world moves and transforms itself. And this compelled him and was constantly involving him in everything he did. And I, in some ways, that speaks to something that is almost always mentioned when one discusses Rozak's art and biography, but you didn't, but which is good because <laughs> right it, it sets us up for it, which is that like many of his generation, many members of his gen generation, his art experienced a radical stylistic transformation in the mid-1940s. If you, again, if you had a chance to see the exhibition, in the cases to your right, as you walk in, you'll see that Rozak really begins as in, in what could be called a kind of constructivist vein. And that, I think, speaks to this almost rigorous scientific inquiry, this idea of making art that would have some connection to either engineering or science, something in the real world that is technical. And that does distinguish his brand of surrealism. If, if we see this transition, which occurs in around 1945, it's exactly the same moment that people like Jackson Pollock discover the drip technique, or Mark Rothko begins his kind of signature um, motif of the, the squares. I mean, many artists right around the end of World War II are finding a, a very unique voice, and I think most of what we see in the show is that later style. We, just, we see the early constructivist work at the beginning, but I think what's so interesting is, uh, unlike those other artists I mentioned, who really embraced the surrealist belief in a kind of untutored, unpremeditated encounter with the unconsciousness, the kind of idea that you'd close your eyes and let your pen direct the imagery and somehow something from the unconsciousness would flow. And of course, one sees that being performed in Pollock's art. And I think even if you know Rozak's um, sculptures, the way that the, the molten uh, metal through the, the heat of the welding torch would produce unexpected results was often seen in, in, a, in a similar way. But this idea that he brought so much knowledge into these visionary images really is quite different than, it really distinguishes his brand of surrealism from a lot of both pre-war and post-war surrealism. I would have to say that he was an obsessive worker. He drew every day for about four hours, regardless of whatever else he was doing. When he made the constructions, he drew four hours a day. When he did paintings, he had to. When he did the welded sculpture, every day, at least four hours. And of course, I think because of the kind of childhood he had and the uh, enormous uh, anxiety and uh, violence that went on, this was his way, this was his safe haven on the one hand, and it was a way of getting beyond it, a way of constantly moving in other directions. He picked steel, ultimately, as his most favorite material, the miserable material to work with. It's very hard. He pounded on that steel. I would be upstairs in, with my mother, you know, doing child, childlike things, hearing him downstairs <laughs> pounding, welding with the torch, pounding on the metal, and it would go on for hours, and he'd come up, and he'd be f black with dirt drenched, and, you know, stuff dripping off of him, go to the bathroom, wash up, come in happy as a lion, absolutely great. We cracked a joke, we'd have dinner together, and we'd all have a good time. But he was working it out constantly with this repetitive pushing of himself, and he would push himself to the point of collapse. And then there would be times when he would just have to go to bed for two or three days and recover. And then he would start in again and start pushing himself again, looking for the image, looking for a new resolution, looking for some other suggestion to develop. So it was, a, he was driven. It was definitely, um, he was somebody who was driven, but he was able also to work it out enough to really be kind of a very successful human being. It's a classic example of sublimation. Yes, right? <laughs> Taking, Freud would have loved it. Right. But, but again, it's, it's quite distinct from, I think, other examples of um, surrealist practice where the idea was not some laborious. It was much more 
to open yourself up in a very tranquil, or if not tranquil, um, certainly not laborious way. And you know, to see the scale of these drawings is truly um, remarkable. I, I, I first saw these images in catalogs, and I had no ideas, no idea how large they were. And just to imagine the amount of labor that went into these drawings, I think, gives you a sense of the kind of drivenness that Sarah's talking about. And again, the idea that you could reach a visionary state through exhaustive, excessive labor is such a different approach than, again, the more characteristic idea of visionary states through some kind of um, trance-like subconscious um, channeling that we typically, again, Pollock, you know, what, what, what I always hear when I teach Pollock to certain undergrads, right? I, I could do that. It's so easy. But no one would ever say that about either <laughs> these drawings or his sculptures. Right. Right? The, the, the amount of labor is no. vividly it's apparent. Huge. And that seemed, but and yet, it's, 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 a, it's amount of labor that doesn't yield a kind of meticulous um, predestined form. That, that's, I think, one of the most interesting things about these works is that there's so much work, and yet you still sense a kind of discovery in the images, often in the, in the way that certain faces and um, latent imagery comes through or kind of emerges in the margins, and he actually writes about this. Maybe, I don't know if that's one of the quotations you have in store where he I says that, that, one, yeah. the, that he uses his drawings as an image source for future drawings and for sculptures. This is where, and he actually uses the term self-propulsive, that drawing for him was this kind of energy source, an image source, so that the kind of labor that he put in would generate more and more work for him, which was, I think, an escape as much as anything. He, li he liked to, he, he, he sort of sort of reached uh, oblivion through exhaustion. It was kind of where he, where he went with it, you know. Mm. Um, with, that, with that drawing, which he did late, much, you know, sort of towards the end of his life, he would just sit there. If, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, it's, it, it t and he calculated, he said it would take an hour for him to do, you know, a three inch square. Mm. So he knew <laughs> if he would sit there and he would do that for three. And he was perfectly happy to do that because while he was doing that, he was thinking about something else. You know, it would be, there would be other ideas going on at the same time. Um, this, this drawing also has those, the dynamic lines. It's not meeting, meeting a, uh, it's not like the train, but it gives you the, the dynamic yeah, yeah. lines of that. That's right. And, um, and I always found this drawing very surprising because um, it was done in the mid-70s. But when I went down to the World Trade Center after that thing blew up, it looked like this. It was very, you know, it, it, that idea, the cataclysm, was something that he was able to capture well before the event actually took place. Which is, I, I mean, to me, that's one of the fundamental characteristics of a kind of oracular, surrealistic, visionary right. practice that somehow, in fact, Barnett Newman famously writes in an essay called The New Sense of Fate from 1945, if we had, if we as Americans or Europeans had paid attention to the first wave of surrealists like Max Ernst, we wouldn't have had this war. Right, that somehow these are strident warnings for us to, he, you know, the pro, it's a prophetic sort of message that these, I think, that Rozak saw these works um, in, 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 entailing. And this is even more explicit, I think, in the sculptural works, probably his most famous sculpture, Spectre of Kitty Hawk, which is in the collection of MoMA and for a long time was in the director's office, Alfred Barr's office. And it's an image that is absolutely um, thinking about the, the danger of aerial bombardment um, that he makes during the war. And it's a specter, so it's about haunting, right? It's both the kind of legacy of technology as expressed in the Wright brothers' invention, but again, the haunting continues. It continues to haunt us. It's, it, and I think that that idea, you know, this is a haunting image in that sense. It's not, it hasn't quite yet met its destination. I think it's also important to say that uh, when he came back from Europe and was really madly in love with uh, the Bauhaus and um, the idea of, of mm -hmm. industry saving the world, that commitment completely deteriorated with World War II. And, and his shift from doing constructions to, doing, to picking a medium that was brutal and uh, primordial and highly expressive was a, a political decision on his part. 
And that is also unusual, I think, that an artist, that it, he actually wanted to be, uh, needed a media that would express his outrage at the disaster of World War II. And, uh, and, and his, uh, his material often is involved with um, events in history that really made him angry. And he would, he would talk about that. When, when Watergate was going on, he did a bunch of satirical drawings on Watergate, mm. completely unrelated to the sculpture, the paintings, everything he just started, you know. I'd like to see those. <laughs> <laughs> they people look familiar. Yeah. It's the same guys over and over again, you yeah. know. Um, so that was, uh, so there was also, on the one hand, this whole visionary idea, but on the other hand, it was political and it was humanistic. And he was involved with trying to make a statement about the individual, the importance of the individual, the need for transcendence, and, uh, and values that were really being run roughshod at that point in history. And yeah, need I say more? Right, it's, a, it's a, another biographical fact that I find very interesting and actually quite characteristic of the artists, the sculptors of his generation, that he actually began welding um, during the war, working at an aircraft plant, right. and that was true of David Smith, as well as um, I believe Richard Lippold. Many of these artists that we associate with the kind of post-war renaissance of direct metal welding all learned their skills making tanks and making airplanes, and so it's very fascinating to think about how these artists were using a medium that had those associations with violence. And yet, as you say, by somehow investing it with these signs of individualism, we're registering that challenge of how, how can one be a kind of active agent in a world that seems increasingly over -technologi technologically determined. So there was, there was this uh, very sophisticated intellectual overlay going on with him on the one hand, and on the other hand, he had this imaginative past coming from his childhood that he was always very directly attached to. So I'm, I'm going to read you a, a, a couple of paragraphs about dinner at his grandmother's house. <laughs> After dinner at grandma's house, she had her own idea of entertainment. And it's very interesting and strange. She would boil a tremendous cauldron of lead, about a two-gallon pot, and she would pick out of this mold in lead with a ladle and then immerse it into a barrel of water and there was tremendous steam. We were all frightened, the hissing sounds. And she would pick out of the water this molten mass, very, um, uh, very irregular, amorphic, and highly suggestive. She would say, now what do you see in it? Of course, we were spellbound because of the steam and this lead and the strange shape by that time, she was pretty high. She was right into the thing, and her hair would sort of be disheveled because she was working in the hot steam, and she was very curious and interested in the whole process herself. But this was my first initiation, without knowing it, into the world of autosuggestion, a kind of early beginning into the introspective character of one's own imagination. And yet it was a frightening experience. And then my grandmother would take this lead form and start telling us stories about what she saw, and I tell you, there were some hair-raising yarns because she herself was telling us what had happened in her life by the suggestion of these images. And again, that made an imprint on her recollection. It was a visual, it was visual, dramatic in its presentation. When I developed certain sculptural forms about 15 years ago, I introduced technical extensions to sculpture with my welding process, which came under the heading of brazing and puddling. And these are reminiscent of the lead stru structure that my grandmother pulled out of the barrel. So he's, you know, he's sore after World War II, and what does he do? He figures out something from his childhood to bring forward and use that to then propel him in a new direction. Because going from the constructions to the welded sculpture was a complete turnabout. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't come, it comes out organically, but not logically. And that's the thing about his work, is that you see a, an 
always connections and affiliations between the differences in the content of what he's doing, and yet it's connected together. There's a wonderful quotation by him that sometimes, uh, I think it's been published, but it's from a symposium that took place in 1952 at the Museum of Modern Art about an exhibition called The New Sculpture. And he says something about this transitional moment. He says, around 1945, the gears came off, he says. And I started to work in reverse. It's a fascinating, he said, I, I went in reverse. So he, yeah, the, with the constructive, constructivist work, he's thinking about technological progress. And then he starts going in reverse. And so you have these almost dinosaur-like images. And one of my favorite details is on the large painting, uh, drawing Western Star on the hallway, where you see just written in pencil on the margins, he writes the word per pterodactyl. So he's somehow thinking about this relationship between stars, which seems very science fiction, and dinosaurs. And, uh, but this idea of somehow going backwards, and it, it speaks to both childhood. There's a kind of, there's that famous um, philosophical conceit that they, the age of one individual from childhood to um, adulthood somehow um, mirrors the civilization of, of mankind from primitive man to civilized man. And I think those two things are kind of operating in his work where his childhood memories are also, he's also channeling this primordial prehistoric past, which I think for many um, people in the post-war period was, had this strange kind of double or axial temporality that there's that wonderful quote by Einstein. They, they asked Einstein in 19... 47, how will World War III be fought? And he says, I don't know how World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones, right? <laughs> so that, this idea that somehow, you know, if we, the future is going to be more like the prehistoric past than this constructivist <clears throat> vision. I think that's really informing so much of this work that it's almost this idea that the future, that the technology is going to lead to a world without technology and perhaps without humans. Right? It's a rather bleak um, vision, but I, I mean, I think works like this <laughs> substantiate um, the bleakness in some ways. I think we're worried about these things these days. So well, it, it, it's it, the story of um, 1945 is still the story of 2016, which is that humanity has um, invented the technological capacities to destroy itself. And what are we going to do about it? And I think that's what Rozak's art has always really, that's been the main meditation of, of these works. It's, it's how to be a human in a technological world, how to remain human, both literally and figuratively. He also was very committed to the history of art at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that when, you, when he looks at the, at the pterodactyls in, in the Museum of Natural History, he also looks at Gothic architecture. Mm -hmm. He's always making a connection between what has already been expressed art historically, and, and, and he ties that into his work. The, uh, the externalization of form, which you see in Gothic architecture, you see in insects, which he looked at constantly, mm -hmm. and you certainly see it in the bones, the remains of, of the dinosaurs. So all of those, so he sees it from a multiple viewpoint of n nature, art history, what's happened, and where is it going? And that gave him a very, very broad pan panorama of material to work with. And a, a lot of strange stuff came out of it. And there are, the drawings are, in many cases, strange. They're interesting, and they're strange. And they're not like anybody else's. Yep. Nobody has done anything like this. Because it's, it's an idiosyncratic sensibility. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely, I mean, the, you see on the, this final, in this final gallery, these insects becoming almost like robots or like circuitry, and that kind of consciousness to recognize these affinities is, um, I think, one of his gifts. Throughout, it's, it's the kind of cosmological imagination that one sees in, in the star drawings as yeah. well. That's yeah. right. So Do we have time for one more? I don't know. How Do we have time? Should I, should I read one, one more quote? One more quote, quote and then we can quote? open it. Um, so which I have two, so which one do I want to do? Oh. Both. <laughs> okay. Seeing with your own self. I think we're endowed with certain properties or attributes that work in the mind, and depending on how efficient the mental apparatus is, 
various kinds of occurrences or insights are revealed. When we think about a man or a woman who is able to see tendencies in life and society, these properties are already working. The cause and effect taking place in the submicroscopic properties of the brain have already gelled, and all that has to be done is for it to be shaped and synthesized. It moves from the amorphous to the concrete. They call it visionary, but actually it's causation along a very deep, complex, ambiguous nature. We don't see with our eyes, we see with our total sensibility. You're seeing with your whole self, and you know this because when we don't feel so well, we don't see so good, oh, it's the other way around. Because when we don't see so well, we don't feel so, is when we don't feel so good. Everything is sort of blurred. But when we see with our bodies, with our nerves, with our eyes, with our total sense of organization, we realize there is a pretty complex synthesis going on constantly that we are responding to. It is something that you can only grasp in the moment when you're off guard. You're relaxed enough for the whole thing to come together and say something into the way of, in the way of, this is what I've experienced, this is how I feel, let's try it. So we put it down on paper, and then sit back and wait to see what happens. So I think that's a very sort of um, uh, analytical and clear thought about what the creative process is or was for him. I mean, he, he, uh, he analyzed it, and then he kept on trying to work, work, it, uh, work it through. I'll read the other quote because it's part of the... Say, it's a different part of the same idea. I've been critical of most everything I've done. The search for new resolution has been the motivation to take on different directions. I was able to sustain an interest in what I was doing until I felt I had done as much with it as I could. There was always a kind of duality. It was a question of doing things with the utmost commitment and being engaged and happy though one was working at the top of one's form during a, the period it was evolving. Once the work was realized, once it was complete, there was a tremendous amount of doubt, reservation, and looking to other areas for new solutions. This is one of the indispensable elements necessary to an active and robust creative life, and one has to constantly do this. Just when you've mastered something, you realize there are other solutions, and you start all over again there is always another mountain to climb. I think it takes a certain kind of objectivity and courage to be able to say, well, I've done something here, but it isn't it. When that stops, I think the whole thing is over. Somehow through this process, I have been able to construct a fairly good body of work. Because the work is evolving out of itself and not out of an objective canon, it all ties up in a strange and original way. Um, yeah. That, that's. A, I mean, the only thing I would add is that, again, to me, the scale of these drawings is one of the most remarkable aspects of them, many of the drawings. And to think about the physicality that went into the, uh, I, I, I often think about the arched line that's one of the most characteristic lines in so many of his drawings, this kind of curve or arc that he makes over and over again, which, again, like the orthogonals that we associate with perspectival drawing uh, presents space. It looks like um, um, a curve or like a, the way fabric buckles. You see that repeatedly in his drawings. But it also, if you kind of imagine the artist actually doing it, you get a sense of the energy. So there's this interesting uh, analog between the physical material energy bodily energy that he put into these. And you see that just through the repetition of these arcs in the depiction of energy. So there's, an, I mean, uh, to me, that idea that somehow it's not just visual, it's physical, is actually being performed in the right. drawings in a way that maybe is not even as visible in the sculpture, even though obviously those took a lot of labor. But the repetition of these lines seems to just make that so, so vivid. Well, thank you for being such an attentive audience. Yes, um, this was a and, pleasure. And I hope you spend time looking at the drawing. <laughs>